chapters 18 on the heart and chapter 19 on the blood vessel. So this will be a shorter unit, which means the time between the exam you're taking on Thursday and the second exam will be a much shorter interval. We'll cover less material. So it'll be heart and blood vessels, chapter 18, which we're going to start today, and chapter 19 on the blood vessels. And in lab, as the morning lab knows, we started our study of the heart anatomy today, which we'll obviously do this afternoon as well. Okay, first of all, the heart itself, as you know, is located in the thoracic cavity in that medial portion, which is called the mediastinum, and it's surrounded on either side by the pleural cavities, which house the lungs. And it's roughly the midline, but most of the heart actually lies more to the left in the midline, about two thirds of it. And it's positioned at an angle, obliquely. The base of the heart is the superior part of the heart to which the major blood vessels attach. And the more tapered or pointed part, which is inferior, is called the apex. Again, it's the mediastinum, that's that medial cavity in the thoracic or chest cavity. It is also surrounded by a protective membrane called a pericardium. Para means around, cardium refers to heart, so literally it's around the heart. It consists of three layers. The superficial layer is dense or fibrous connective tissue. So it's called the fibrous pericardium. And it's a very tough layer. So again, this is the outermost or superficial layer of a heart wall. Again, it's made of dense or fibrous connective tissue. So it's a tough membrane that surrounds and helps to protect the heart. It also anchors the heart to the diaphragm, which lies just inferior to it. And the diaphragm is that band of skeletal muscle that runs transversely and separates the thoracic from the abdominal pelvic cavity. It also attaches the large blood vessels that come out of the base or attach the base to the heart. And further, it helps to prevent the heart from overstretching. That's the fibrous pericardium, the superficial part of the pericardium. Just deep to that is a serous membrane. Now you may remember, perhaps you don't, from AP1, hopefully you've talked a little bit about membranes, mucous membranes, serous membranes, and so on. Serous membranes are a double-layered membrane. They consist of two thin layers. <coughs> the more superficial layer is called the parietal layer, and the deep layer is called the visceral layer. So we have a parietal serous pericardium and a visceral serous pericardium, which are both deep to the fibrous pericardium. The parietal pericardium is attached to the fibrous pericardium, fibrous pericardium and lines it. The visceral pericardium, or excuse me, the, the visceral serous pericardium is attached to the surface of the heart wall. And it's actually considered the outermost layer of the heart wall. So you'll see it also referred to as the epicardium. And again, both these are very thin membranes, simple squamous epithelium. Remember, simple squamous, a single layer of flattened cells, and a little bit of loose connective tissue. Both these secrete a fluid, the parietal and visceral layer, and that's called pericardial fluid, and it's in a little space or cavity between the two. And that acts as a lubricant. Of course, as the heart is moving with contraction and relaxation, these membranes slide across one another. So you need a lubricant, just like you're doing a, a vehicle engine. You wouldn't have moving parts without the lubricant, or pretty soon it would seize because of the friction, it builds up the heat. So again, we got the outer membrane, denser fibrous connective tissue. Deep to that is the serous pericardium consisting of two layers. That outer layer, the parietal layer, attached to the lines, the fibrous pericardium, the inner layer, the visceral pericardium, is attached to the heart wall, and actually considered the outermost layer of the heart wall, so it's also known as epicardium. Again, space between the and visceral layer, called the pericardial cavity, that's normally filled with pericardial fluid. It acts as a lubricant. Sometimes things are awry, you don't have enough fluid, and then you get an inflammation of pericardium, that's called pericarditis. With inflammation, what happens? You get fluid accumulation, so you 
build up more fluid in that space, that puts pressure on the heart, and that's called cardiac tamponade. And that can make it more difficult for the heart to do its job, because it's putting pressure on the heart itself. <coughs> This is a new textbook. You can see this highway view of the heart, heart wall. And you can see here is the surrounding membrane, the outermost, which is a thick layer of connective tissue, denser parts of connective tissue, the fibrous pericardium. Then lining that would be the final layer of the serous pericardium. You can see it, it adheres to and lines the fibrous pericardium. And there's a space that's the pericardial cavity, which is filled with fluid, pericardial fluid. And then the epicardium, again, is a thin layer, and that would be the visceral layer of the serous pericardium. That adheres to the heart wall. So it's also known as the epicardium. Okay, so that's the pericardium. Fibrous pericardium on the outside, lined with the final pericardium, then the space, pericardial cavity, covering the surface of the heart wall itself and considered the outermost layer of the heart wall, the epicardium, which is synonymous with the visceral pericardium. Okay. Again, in this space, the pericardial cavity, you have fluid, which actually is lubricant. Okay. Cardium again, remember, this is the visceral layer of the serous pericardium. The myocardium then is the thick muscular layer that makes up the middle of the heart wall and the majority of the heart wall. And this consists of cardiac muscle, which as you know is confined to the heart. Cardiac muscle somewhat resembles skeletal muscle in that it is striated by these alternating light and dark bands that are visible under the light microscope when you view a stain preparation. But unlike skeletal muscle, it is involuntary, which means it's not under conscious control. You can't decide when to contract and relax your heart. It happens automatically, fortunately. You don't have to think about it, okay? You can adjust the heart rate. You don't basically just stop it or turn it on and off. It's an ongoing process. So again, this is the myocardium. It consists of cardiac muscle, striated muscle, an involuntary muscle. And you'll also notice, when you look at sections of cardiac muscle, which you probably did in AP1, that it has something we don't see in skeletal muscle. And these are called intercalated discs. The intercalated discs also run transversely, but they're much thicker than the striations, those alternating light and dark bands, which have to do with the arrangement of thickens and filaments. What they are, though, is a thickening in the cell membrane between adjacent cardiac muscle cells, which helps to support those cells. So it's a thickening in the cell membrane between adjacent cardiac muscle cells. And within it, that, it has basically what are called desmosomes, which help to hold those adjacent cells together. So you see in the intercalated discs, these desmosomes. And then something else, very important, junctions. So the desmosomes consist of fibers that help to hold the adjacent cardiac muscle cells together. Gap junctions are tiny little pores or openings in the intercalated disc which allow for the spread or rapid transmission of oxygen potentials between the cardiac muscle cells. 
Heart muscle cells work together as a single unit to give you more forceful pumping action, much like you see in most smooth muscle. It works as a single unit. Unlike skeletal muscle, where you have these motor units, you got a bunch of muscle fibers basically, which basically are stimulated by usually a single somatic motor neuron, and they tend to work in small groups in skeletal muscle. Smooth muscle usually works as a single unit, at least most smooth muscle, and so does cardiac muscle. For a very obvious reason, if the cells kind of track independently, you wouldn't get any effective pumping action. So working as a single unit, when you stimulate one cell, you basically quickly stimulate all the cells, and they get this contraction in unison to give you a nice forceful pumping action. So these gap junctions basically allow for rapid transmission of action potentials between the chronic muscle cells, so they can contract and relax together. As we're going to see when we get into the conduction system of the heart tomorrow in lab, the heart is, contains specialized cells that are self-stimulatory. The heart can beat independently even when it's, you sever all connections in the nervous system. The nervous system does not stimulate the heart to contract. What it does is just heart rate and force of contraction. The actual physical stimulation lies within the heart itself in specialized tissue called conduction tissue. You probably heard of pacemaker. We're talking about natural pacemaker, which is built in, built in basically the heart itself. Okay? But for that to work effectively, the heart has to pump at a certain rhythm. You want to basically have the atria contract and shoot the blood into the ventricles, then the ventricles contract and shoot the blood out. They get out of sequence and you do not get an effective pumping action. And if those cells contract independently, you're also not going to get an effective pumping action. That's why you've got to have coordination in the contraction in these muscle cells, working as a single unit. Very important. And these gap junctions in the intercalate disc allow for this rapid transmission. Okay, these are actually electrical synapses. When you were studying the nervous system, you may have talked about these chemical synapses, electrochemical synapses, which is typically what you see between, let's say, a nerve and a muscle cell, or nerve to nerve. Now, when you've got the impulse, the potential coming down the axon, it stimulates the release of a neurotransmitter that diffuses across the synaptic tract. It's picked up by another cell, a postsynaptic cell, maybe another neuron, or maybe a muscle cell. So it's electrochemical, the chemical being a neurotransmitter. And that's a one-way passage. Can't go either direction, goes one way. These electrical synapses go either way. And you're basically sending part particles, basically, from one cell to another. So very rapid transmission and coordination of the contraction activity. Very important, these gap junctions in the intercalated disc, the cardiac muscle cell. Okay, also too, when you were studying the heart, or I should say the skeletal muscle, AMP1, you probably learned there's a lot of connective tissue sheaths around the muscle, skeletal muscle that is. There's a dense, Harvest connective tissue membrane that surrounds the actual muscle itself, the entire muscle. That's called the epimysium. There's also connective tissue sheaths, usually dense or harvest connective tissue, around bundles of skeletal muscle fibers called fascicles, paramysium. And then the individual cells themselves have a loose connective tissue sheath called the endomysium. So epimysium to paramysium to endomysium. So skeletal muscle is well supported by connective tissue. That is not the case. In cardiac muscle, cardiac muscle, the only sheaths you really have are the endomysium around the individual muscle fibers. So, to support the muscle, cardiac muscle, in the myocardium, you have a fiber skeleton of the heart, which consists of bundles of collagen fibers. It's denser fibrous connective tissue that runs through the myocardium and supports it. That's called the fiber skeleton of the heart. So it's sort of like a built-in internal skeleton. But it's not bone and cartilage, it's denser fibrous connective tissue. The fiber skeleton of the heart. Okay, so that's the myocardium, the thickest the middle layer of the heart wall. The line of the heart then, again, is a very thin layer, simple squamous epithelium, a little bit loose connective tissue, and that's called the endocardium. This lines the heart chambers, the atrium and ventricles, and covers the surface of the heart valves. Those of you in the morning lab know what the heart valves do. What's the function of the heart valves? Make sure the blood flow is going in one direction and you don't get backflow into a chamber from which the blood came when the succeeding chamber relaxes. Remember that? So you have valves between the atrium and the ventricles, you got valves in the arteries that drain the ventricles. 
And as I said, we went through that this morning, and we'll do it this afternoon as well. Okay? Again, the endocardium is the lining of the heart chambers and carrying heart valves. Simple squamous, liver and loose connective tissue, and not surprising, it's continue with the endothelium. What's the endothelium? Hope that rings a bell. It should. The endothelium is the inside. Should know it. Inside. It's the line of the blood vessels. Simple squamous, loose connective tissue. So the endothelium line of the blood vessels continues with the endocardium of the heart. Quite similar. Okay. So three layers. Epicardium on the surface, also called the visceral pericardium. Simple squamous, loose connective tissue, very thin. And the big thick layer in the middle, largely pari muscle, and then these bundles of fibrous connective tissue here run through to support it, part of the skeleton of the heart. And then the line again, very thin, simple squamous, loose connective tissue, endocardium. Okay. They're called endocarditis, that's where we get an inflammation of the endocardium, which sometimes results from a bacterial infection. Okay, the four chambers by now, that should be second nature to you. We got a pair of atria, okay? And the atrium member receives blood, returning to the heart. Remember, VABA. Veins carry blood to the heart. It always comes into an atrium. From an atrium, it goes to a ventricle. From ventricle, it exits via an artery. So veins, <coughs> atria, to ventricles, to arteries. All right, so a pair of atria, atrium singular, atrium plural. What are the oracles? Those are those on the lateral margins, okay, of the atria, kind of look like little folds. So they're actually part of the atria, sometimes called the regular appendix. And the ventricles then, of course, these are the muscular pumping chambers that actually push the blood out from the heart. And remember, there's a partition that divides the heart into right and left sides. Between the two atria, it's called the interatrial septum. Inter means between. And septum is just a wall or partition. So the interatrial septum divides the right from the left atrium. You've also got a partition between the ventricles. That's called the interventricular septum. Again, the wall or partition, in this case, dividing the ventricles, right and left, one another. Also, on the surface of the heart, there was a shallow groove called a sulcus. When you were studying the bones, you learned all these terms, okay? And one should have been sulcus, which is a shallow groove, okay? In this case, it's a shallow groove on the surface heart. In the front, it's called the anterior ventricular sulcus, and it basically runs between the right and left ventricle. The back of the heart is called the posterior interventricular sulcus. Again, shallow groove between the right and left ventricle. There's also a groove that runs around the circumference of the heart, separating the atria from the ventricles below. That's called the atroventricular sulcus or the coronary sulcus because this is where your coronary sinus runs. Remember the coronary sinus is that big vein that is draining all the cardiac veins into the right atrium. So septum is the wall or partition. The sulcus is the groove, shallow groove on the surface heart. And you often have blood vessels running along those grooves. Okay. So again, atrial surge blood, you see blood returning via the veins to the heart. They push it into the ventricles. The ventricles then pump it out from the heart to arteries. Veins to atria to ventricles to arteries. And all you have to do is plug in the major vessels. Common everyday words, right? Household words. In KB and so on. Okay, valves. The valves, again, ensure a one-way flow, just like we saw in the lymphatic vessels. They're to keep the blood flowing in one direction. In that case, it was always toward the heart. In this case, it's to keep it going in a certain direction through the heart, which is something I want you to know. I think I've said it before, and I'll say it again. Learn the normal blood flow through the heart, okay? And since you'll be learning the details of the heart, okay, I'll expect you to tell me the chambers and the valves as well as the major blood vessels and any organs that lie between right and left side, which would be what? The lungs. Okay. Blood is returned 
from the body goes into what? All blood returning from the body. The atrium. The right atrium, okay? Deoxygenated. There it goes into the? Lungs. Not yet. Right ventricle, okay? Right ventricle out to the lungs, then back from the lungs to the left atrium, to the left ventricle, and out. All the chambers, the valves, and of course, don't forget the lungs in between. And what I'll probably do is give you a vein on the left side of the body and ask you to trace it through the heart to an artery on the right side. And whatever you do, don't take the blood, regardless of what vein is coming in, and take it directly into the left side of the heart. <laughs> left side of the heart, remember, handles only oxygenated blood. So what do veins do? For the most part, they're carrying deoxygenated blood returning to the heart. So where's it going to go first? Right. Always to the right side, right atrium, right ventricle, lung, then back to the left atrium, left ventricle, and out. All right? The only blood vessels that carry blood into the left atrium are what? Pulmonary veins. The pulmonary vein only. Okay? So if I give you a left brachiocephalic vein, don't take it in the left atrium. Whatever you do, don't connect it to the aorta. Veins and major arteries never directly connect. Okay? Or you blow the vein out. You know, the wall is so thin. So veins always have to what? Go first to an atrium, atrium to ventricle, ventricle out to the artery. Okay? So think about this. So let's left side, therefore, let's go to the left side of the artery. No. It's got to return first to the right side, then to the lungs, then back to the left before it goes back out. Yes? Yeah, I'll say trace from this vein, left to right, to this artery, left to right. So that would include but in between will lie the heart. Mm -hmm. That would include the major arteries and veins in the mm -hmm. body. Yes, okay. I'll say all the major blood vessels, all the valves, chambers, and of course, put the lungs in there. All right? And guess what? Left and right, left and right, superior, inferior, so on. Okay? So be thinking about that. What connects to what? We're going to do this through the whole course. Okay? Get the respiratory system, I'll say trace the air from the outside of the body to the alveoli and back. Inhaled, exhaled. All right? Get the digestive system, trace through the digestive tract. From oral cavity, the mouth, to the anus. All the way through. Okay? So get used to it. What connects to what? <laughs> I'm talking about it's taken closer to me before they say. It's great on these trace questions. You better know the trace. <laughs> Get your warning right now. You will see them. Okay, the chambers then. We've talked about, let's look at the valves. Four chambers, four valves. Now you can see the heart valves themselves are composed of dense or fibrous connective tissue. And guess what? They're covered by the endocardium, the same stuff that lines the heart chambers. Their function is to keep the blood from flowing back into the chamber from which it came. <coughs> we have a pair of valves that lie between the atria and the ventricles. So collectively, these are referred to as atrial ventricular valves, but I would like you to know them by their specific name. On the right side, the atrial ventricular valve is called the tricuspid valve. The cusp is the valve flap. Tricuspid because it's got three cusps or flaps. So again, this lies between the right atrium and the right ventricle. And its purpose is to keep blood from flowing back into the right atrium when the right ventricle contracts, which means that valve has to close before the ventricle contracts. Otherwise, it's going to shoot right back into the atrium. So the only exit from the ventricle will be the artery which drains that ventricle. On the left side, the atrial ventricular valve is called the bicuspid valve, also known as the micro valve. You may know it as the micro valve. Either term is acceptable. Bicuspid because it has only two cusps or flaps. And again, this valve lies between the left atrium and the left ventricle. And again, it serves to prevent the backflow of blood into the atrium when that ventricle contracts. So those valves close before the ventricles contract. 
So again, the only exit for the blood is through the artery draining that particular ventricle. Now, both the trunk cuts and butt cuts and valves have cords of collagen fibers attached to the valve cusps at one end. At the other end, they attach to extensions of the cardiac muscle in the ventricles. These have a fancy name, they're called capillary muscles. And those of you in the morning lab, I'm sure you saw these. You saw the chordae tendinae, you saw the extensions, the papillary muscles, and the valve cusps. Okay? And their function again is to keep the valve cusps together. So when the ventricles contract and slam blood up against the walls, they're going to hit those valve cusps. There's nothing holding them in place. What are they going to do? They're going to open, blood goes right back into the atrium. And you're not going to get much pumping action from that ventricle. So you've got to have intact valves. If the valves aren't working properly, they're really leaky. What happens? You're not getting effective pumping. It may be so severe that you have to have a valve replacement. Otherwise, you're not going to be pumping out much oxygenated blood. And the result is you're not oxygenating the tissues very well. Does that, always, does that also affect your breathing? Well, if you're it can not affect, you'd be breathing, but you may be panting a lot trying to get more air in because you're not effectively aerating the blood. So the so blood people flowing have a valve with problem, yes. Right. It's very severe. Now, a lot of people have a minor you know, leak in a valve that's called a murmur. Uh, they can live with that. But if it's really severe and you're getting a lot of backflow of blood, then it may require repair or replacement <coughs> of that valve. Cardiac tendon, also called the heart strain. Okay. And of course, we tend to associate, or at least originally we associate emotions with the heart. Okay? But in reality, the emotions are centered in the brain, and specifically the hypothalamus. But it doesn't sound very romantic to say you love someone with all your hypothalamus. <laughs> <laughs> okay. They don't have any science background, they'll probably get slapped in the face if you're a guy, because she'll think you're you know, making fun of her or you're talking about some other anatomical part. <laughs> okay? semi-lunar. On the left side, the artery that drains the left side, if I remember, that's the aorta. This is called the aortic semi-lunar valve. And in both cases, the valve flaps or cusps are kind of cup-shaped. And these are passive valves. When the ventricles contract, it shoots the blood out, and it simply parts the cusps. The blood shoots on that artery then, then when the ventricle relaxes, some of the blood is going to flow back from that artery and try to get back into the ventricle. But what happens is it catches in the cup-shaped cusps, pulls them together, and closes the valve. So these are the semilunar valves. On the right side, in the pulmonary trunk, the pulmonary semilunar valve. On the left side, the aortic semilunar valve. Again, the cusps of the semilunar valves have these three pocket-like, pocket-like, or cup-shaped I want you to call them pulmonary, semilunar, and aortic semilunar. They can just call them pulmonary and aortic. I want you to have that semilunar here. I want you to know that I've got these cup shaped cusps. Okay? Mm -hmm. Don't say what the book says. Okay? The book's not <laughs> making up the test. The book I'm <laughs> making up the test. All right? so, this is not a democracy, okay? <laughs> it's a dictatorship. Okay? Hopefully, a benevolent one. textbook and it shows basically the valves. Gives you an idea how they work. Okay, what we're showing here is an atrioventricular valve. Okay? And 
what you have here, and I'm showing you here over on the left side of the heart. So you basically have the bicuspid valve here, and these are the valve cuts, they're the flaps. These are the bundles of collagen fibers with the cornea tendinae, and these are the extensions of muscle in the interior of the ventricles called the papillary muscles. So what happens is, of course, when the valve's open to this position, and the blood just simply flows in from the atrium into the corresponding ventricle. <coughs> then when the ventricle is ready to contract, these muscles contract, what they do is they hold the valve cusps together, like you can see here. So the ventricle contract and keeps the blood up against the walls, also against the cusps. These things aren't going to part and allow the blood to go back into the atrium, which it can. So as we're going to see, these muscles contract first. They basically are holding the valve cusps in place prior to the rest of the ventricle contracting and shoot that blood up against the walls and the valve cusps. And that's the way both the tricuspid and bicuspid valves work. Okay? Cordae tendon again. You find those are collagen fibers. On one end, they're attached to the valve cusps. That's the tricuspid valve on the right, bicuspid valve on the left. And the papillary muscles, which are extensions of muscle inside the ventricles. Okay? So they hold the valve cusps in place, keep the valve closed, when the ventricle contracts. Otherwise, they're open. As we're going to see, actually, most of the blood flows through the open tricuspid and bicuspid valve before the atrium even contracts. And then when they do contract, they shoot the rest of the blood from the atrium in the ventricles. And then before the ventricles contract, the valves close because the cusps are held in place by the chorea tendinae attached to the papillary muscles. And then the only outlet for that blood when the ventricle contracts is through the semi valves and the arteries that drain that corresponding ventricle. Okay. And again, take a look at this in your chart. This just shows the semi valves, okay? Again, we're talking about <coughs> the left side here. You can see to the left and the right. But what you can see is when the ventricles contract, of course, they shoot the blood out through the arteries. In this case, on the right side, it would be through the pulmonary trunk. On the left side, it shoots it out through the aorta. But in both cases, you have these cup-shaped or pocket-like cusps. And they're constant valves, there's no cardiac tendon in here. So the blood basically just passes out, separates the cusp, and shoots out into the artery when that ventricle contracts. And when the ventricles relax, then that blood is going to flow back. It's going to ca catch these cup shaped cusps and pull them together and close the valve. So the blood doesn't leak back into the ventricle from which it came. So in all cases, the valve is to keep the blood from going back into the chamber from which it came. Try custom by custom valve, keep the blood flowing back from flowing back into the atria when the ventricles contract, and the semilunar valves on both right and left side keep the blood flowing back from the artery into the ventricle from which it drains. Okay? Or which it exits. Any questions on this? Again, look at the diagrams here again. It refers to the valve. Try custom valve and by custom valve, not just atrial ventricular and then the pulmonary semilunar valve in the pulmonary trunk draining the right ventricle, and the aortic semilunar valve in the aorta draining the left ventricle. Okay. Any questions? Okay. <coughs> Let's trace the normal pathway of blood then through the heart. said a number of times, VAVA. It's always veins to atria to ventricles to arteries. That's the normal flow through the heart. And remember, the right side of the heart is associated with the pulmonary circuit through lungs and back to the heart. And the left side is associated with the systemic circuit out to the rest of the body and back to the heart. So let's just plug in the veins and the vessels. We're going to start with blood returning from most of the body, which goes into the right atrium. And the major veins that carry blood into the right atrium, which you should know by now, are the superior vena cava, then the upper part of the body, head, neck, arms, shoulder region. 
inferior vena cava, we're only going to strain the lower part of the body, rest of the body and the legs, and then the coronary sinus, which actually drains the heart wall itself. Okay, so blood comes in to the right atrium, the right atrium attracts and pushes the rest of the blood through the open tricuspid valve into the right ventricle. Then the tricuspid valve closes, the right ventricle contracts, this forces the blood through the only exit, which is the open pulmonary sinometer valve into the pulmonary trunk. And that, of course, quickly splits to the right and left pulmonary arteries, which carry the blood from the right ventricle out to the lungs, the right and, lungs, right and left lungs, respectively. There, of course, the blood picks up oxygen and gives off carbon dioxide, then it returns to the left atrium via the right and left pulmonary veins. Again, be careful. When you look at those lung models, the blue vessels are what? Those are the arteries, and the red ones are the veins. And as I said, just that pulmonary circuit is an exception, a general rule that arteries are carrying blood of higher oxygen content than corresponding veins, not of the pulmonary circuit. Where's the other exception? You saw it on the pin, wasn't it? Where the vein is carrying the blood of higher oxygen content. The baby to the placenta. The umbilical. The umbilical. Okay, remember you had a pair of umbilical arteries on the inside of the urinary bladder, and one single umbilical vein coming back, higher oxygen content than those arteries. All right, so it comes back to the left atrium. Left atrium then pushes the rest of the blood with the contraction <coughs> into the left ventricle, the open tricuspid valve. Then the tricuspid valve closes. Left ventricle contracts. This forces the blood through the only exit vein, which would be the open semilunar valve, the only semilunar valve, out into the aorta, which then distributes it to the other arteries to the rest of the body. Mm -hmm. <laughs> knows you already know those vessels anyway. But don't forget the lungs in between, and don't forget the only vessels returning blood to the left atrium are what? Right and left pulmonary veins. Okay, so you've got a vessel on the left, a vein, you're asked to trace through the heart to an artery. You've got to go first into the right side of the heart, to the lungs, then back to the left. We, we'd easier. like for you to. It's a lot easier to grade when they're, you got all the answers there. I don't have to stumble through these. You know. Okay, that's what makes some of these lab tests tough. You got to go through them. It's, what did she say? What did he say? You know, I got to look at all of them and look. All right. But anyway, just make my life easier too. Right. <laughs> Keep me happy. I like to see all get A's if possible. All right. Doesn't usually happen, but the more the better. Thank you, Kate. Thank you. Any questions on this? Okay. Should be able to trace the blood through the heart. If you have a vein anywhere in the body, you can take it through the heart into an artery. You worry about it. It'll be major ones, don't worry. Okay. Also, you should know by now that the heart wall itself is too thick to provide much benefit from the blood passing through the chambers. So, this reason has its own circulatory system. And this consists of arteries that branch off the ascending aorta. These are actually the first branches off the aorta, even before you get to that aortic arch. And these are the left coronary artery and the right coronary artery, which then branch into smaller and smaller arteries that supply the heart wall itself with oxygenated blood and nutrients. And as you can see, they're just beyond or just superior to the early semilunar valve. These are the first vessels that actually branch off the aura. They're coming off the ascending aura. Okay. I want you to know there are two major branches off of each of these arteries. Okay, so on the left coronary artery, the two major branches are the anterior interventricular artery and the circumflex artery. Again, these branch off the left coronary artery, anterior and ventricular artery, and the circumflex artery. Now the anterior and ventricular artery 
runs down the anterior interventricular sulcus. Now that's the groove on the surface of the heart between left and right ventricle. And it supplies the anterior walls of both ventricles. So the anterior interventricular artery is a major branch off the left corner artery, runs down the anterior interventricular sulcus. That's that groove on the surface of the heart between the two ventricles. You can probably see that on the bottom. And again, it supplies blood to the anterior walls of both ventricles. And also to the interventricular sulcus. The other major artery coming off the secondary, or excuse me, the left corner artery is called the circumflex artery. The circumflex artery runs along the coronary basoventricular sulcus between the left atrium and left ventricle, and it supplies the wall of the left atrium and also the left ventricle because it gives off branches that supply both. So it's coming off again the left corner artery on the lateral side of the left ventricle. So again, these are the two major branches of the left corner artery. And of course, they branch into smaller and smaller arteries, which you may uh, concern yourself with. The right coronary artery runs along the coronary sulcus on the right side of the heart. Remember, that's the groove between the atrium and ventricles, so around the equator of the heart. And it splits into two major branches. The posterior interventricular artery, which runs along the posterior interventricular sulcus at the backside heart and supplies the posterior wall of both left and right ventricle. That's the posterior interventricular artery. So it supplies the posterior wall of both ventricles, left and right. And the other major branch off the right corner artery, you can see, is the marginal artery. And that marginal artery supplies the lateral wall of the right ventricle. So these are the two major branches off of the left and right coronary artery, which I'd like you to know. Okay. And in lab, I expect you to take out these vessels on the heart monitors, not on the sheep hearts, which are injected, but on the heart monitors, so readily visible. Returning blood then. veins. So coronary arteries, cardiac veins. So I number these, but I'm only going to require you to know two. And these veins all drain into a major vein called the coronary sinus. That is, you've already seen, that runs along the atrial ventricular sulcus, especially prominent at the back side of the heart, and runs into the right atrium, where it's draining blood from the heart itself. The two major cardiac veins are the anterior part heart, the great cardiac vein, which runs along that anterior ventricular sulcus, roughly paralleling the anterior ventricular artery. And again, it drains the anterior part of the heart. And the back of the heart then, the middle cardiac vein, which runs along the posterior ventricular sulcus, and roughly parallels the posterior ventricular artery, and it drains the posterior portion of the heart. So great cardiac vein, anterior, <coughs> and middle cardiac vein, posterior. There are also other cardiac veins you don't even have to be those. Those are the two major ones I want you to see. And again, they're readily visible on the heart monitors. And also the 